Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna be talking all about why you should be fishing up in shallow water this winter. We got Joel Nelson and he's gonna share a bunch of really good tips that'll help you catch more fish. And the first thing that he's gonna cover down on is why he thinks fishing up shallow can be so effective. Uh, in a hub house, fishing shallower than a lot of the rest of the crowd. And it's something that's kind of been a trend for me lately, especially the past five years or so. I, I, I can honestly say that I fish shallower now than I ever used to and for more different species, not just panfish in the weeds, but a lot of times walleyes, a lot of times perch. And I, it started out in necessity on some of my favorite lakes in that nowadays with so many people having great mapping, either on their fish finder or on their phone, it's more accessible than it ever was before. So contours are out there and people know how to read them better than they ever used to before. So a lot of the popular structural locations, old honey holes, hard breaks, underwater points and the like, they're filled with people. There's fish houses on them, they're drilled out. There's a lot of people that have put pressure into those areas. So kind of out of necessity in the haunts that I, I tend to fish, I've just been finding myself shallower and away from the crowd. And it's been a fairly successful play. I mean, first and foremost, I think panfish, right? A lot of times these situations are pretty weedy, um, but I'm really finding an interesting kind of wrinkle in human psychology and that when we're looking at these contours and we expect fish to be in these hard turns or inside pockets all these great fishy looking pieces of habitat more and more in the crowd that I run with and amongst some of the professional anglers that I fish with and myself we're finding success in needle in the haystack wide open flat absolutely no change in the contours not even a bump or a twist or a turn to indicate it might be different there and more than ever uh, we're finding success there i think simply because these are unharassed populations of fish there always have been fish in these locations but when you're away from the crowd um, more and more as pressure picks up I, I think you have a distinct advantage in those places now when you're looking at a big vast flat whether that is weeds on it rocks any of the above and there's not a lot of structure it can be hard to kind of pinpoint what areas might be good and productive and that's what Joel's going to talk about next just kind of determining what a really good area is when you're fishing shallow so that might sound a little bit vague uh, almost like I'm trying to lead you astray or, or chase you off but really it, there is a little bit of method to the madness and for me it did start with a lot more shallow water panfish bites and it started with underwater camera work, to be honest. Uh, drilling holes, having a pocket or a handheld size camera, going around and finding spots in the weeds that weren't like the others. And that's really the only trick to it, in my mind. Uh, you're just looking for something different. Now, different can be a million things. It could be a sunken Christmas tree in the weeds. It could be an open bare spot, kind of like a sand hump in the weeds where there's no thick weed growth and just kind of a bare spot. It could be a transition of one weed type or one aquatic species to another, or there could be just a weed edge off either the inside break, which is typically where I'm spending more time, uh, or even the outside weed line, as long as it's not too deep, because then we're, we're starting to get to kind of the traditional structure that's marked really well on the contour map. So, so you still are looking for differences, but the differences might not be readily apparent on a contour map is I guess what I'm trying to say. And underwater cameras have just really changed the way I fish in that regard. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always hole hopping and dropping the camera and looking for spots like this constantly. A, a lot of times it involves getting in an area with decent weed growth and hunkering down, um, setting up a hub just like we're at right now uh, staring at the other underwater camera and giving it 15, 20 minutes, half hour, because the other thing that we're figuring out is the effect of overhead pressure, especially in shallow water environments, right? Uh, I had a really interesting thing. Uh, last year, my son Isaac was on a four-wheeler 50 yards away. I had a bass and bluegills kind of approaching my bait from different directions. He was 50 yards away, and the crunch of that ATV on the ice they literally turned inside out to swim away. They just, it spooked so, so heavily and so, so hard, so violently they spooked. And he was a long ways away, so I just thought to myself, you know, hole hopping in shallow water environments, especially in pressured waters, it just doesn't make much sense. I, I just, time and time again now, I've had so much visual confirmation of fish spooking, 
that it does take an investment. I'd say a half hour at least. Um, sometimes 15 minutes isn't enough to let things settle down. And after a half hour, you've kind of checked off an area, right? Like with an underwater camera, with any clarity, you can view a little bit. And then a lot of times I'll pick a different part of the flat altogether. I'll just go to the other end of it. Or I'll go somewhere in between the middle and the end and see how different it really is. If it's just like what I saw before, eh, I'm not as interested, right? If there's some differences, well then I'm like, okay, well this spot's different and this spot's different. Where's the break, right? Where, where, where is the transition from one weed type to another? So I'll drill holes on my way over to them to try and find where that difference in, in the flat is. And just that little bit of poking around, it, it may sound random, it may sound like, hey, I'm just gonna get lucky and stumble onto a spot. But that act of just being observational, checking out different places, seeing what you see, staying put, these hubs have just been invaluable for, for being able to hunker down, stare at a camera, and learn as fish come to you. One thing that's really cool about these shallow water bites is the fact that they actually just seem to get better and better as we get deeper into the season. And uh, Joel's gonna explain a little bit about why that can be the case. So one thing that I think uh, that I've definitely seen these past couple of years especially is as the season wears on, these shallow water spots can get even better. And you know, first ice we're used to fishing weeds and shallow. Uh, a lot of times fish aren't out in the basin per se and, and, and they can be in shallow, but a lot of times you've got that black ice, you've got very little snow on top of the ice, you've got great light penetration, they're even more spooky and skittish than they normally are. But as midwinter kind of sets up and more people stream out onto the ice, uh, I really feel like some of these areas, the only pressure they get is driven over occasionally. Um, but most people follow the same paths out onto the ice. So if you pick a spot in the shallows away from those road locations, um, you're fishing pretty virgin territory for the most part. And then you talk late ice, well, naturally the fish are gonna be moving closer to the spawn and those weeds come alive and a lot of invertebrate activity within them with more penetrating light. And uh, yeah, it's just something that just, that shallow water bite, especially for panfish, just continues to get better and better and better as the season goes on. One thing that I think is really cool when I'm fishing up shallow is you really get to see the predator-prey relationship. There's a lot going on up in the weeds, all different types of species, and they relate to each other in different ways. And Joel's gonna talk a little bit about that right now. So after observing uh, so many different fish species in the shallows uh, via underwater camera, catching these fish, uh, I can think of several bites middle winter and late ice where there's just this really strong predator prey uh, interdependency right there's there's all these cause and effect things that are going on and as we get you know closer to later ice definitely see bass and pike becoming more active and panfish behave interestingly because of that right as bass start to go on the prowl panfish a lot of times will just hang tighter to, to closer cl to uh, some of the denser clumps of weeds. But the other thing they do is they just move more. I, I end up seeing more fish because bass and, and pike are moving these fish around. Um, and that's where location, location, location can be really important. I'm sure everybody's been in a hub or something like this where one hole is catching all the fish. As bass and pike really start herding and chasing fish around, that's where you get that effect because one spot they'll feel really comfortable and really safe and they can eat there and not feel that by eating they're overexposing themselves to being preyed upon um, but maybe all the rest of the holes are too far out in no man's land out in the open and uh, by eating they would be exposing themselves to, to being chomped by a pike or something like that so i see that a lot where as you get towards later ice and as you're in these shallow spots, you really need to be spot on the spot specific. And that's again, where an underwater camera comes in handy. But you know, one thing I will also say about big bluegills, um, big bluegills and bass really go hand in hand. I just, I've seen so often that the best big bluegill lakes I have are also great bass lakes. And if you're catching bass, uh, you shouldn't necessarily feel all that bad about it because some good gills are probably pretty close behind. Now, I can say there's one lake that I fish in particular, maybe you guys can relate. Uh, it has like two or three great cabbage beds in the lake and they're so good. They're just this jungle-like cabbage and it's just gorgeous. 
but the bass and the pike love these spots so much, both smallies and largemouth love these spots so much that they just patrol endlessly. And the population for those predators is so good, but the bluegills are huge in there too, so I can't like stay away from this spot, but I have a 30 minute bite window at night, and that's the only time I can catch those big bluegills. It's the only time where these panfish feel like, okay, I'm gonna risk it guys. I'm, I'm gonna leave the jungle and I'm gonna come out on the edge of this thing or maybe some of the inside pockets and feed. So just another lesson about how every lake can be different. There is no one size fits all, but by kind of you know, intruding into the shallows a little bit more, especially if you're one of the few anglers that are gonna be up there for the given lake that you're at, you're gonna learn more, you're gonna see more, and, and I firmly believe you're gonna catch more. Personally, my favorite time of year to fish up in shallow water is on late ice, you know, no matter what you're fishing for, but especially for panfish, uh, just because those areas tend to reoxygenate in late ice and there's a lot of activity. And Joel's gonna talk more about that late ice bite up in the shallows. So late ice is, is one of my favorite times of the year to fish. And, and to be honest, if it wasn't for like an all year onslaught of cold and, and wind and snow, I think it would be everybody's favorite time to fish because quite truly, I think late ice, from my experience, has just been better quality fishing than even early ice. And a lot of that relates to the way that you'll have a late ice pattern set up. And the best late ice years are years where it really takes not just a long time, but when you have uh, maple syrup weather, uh, when you've got the warm days and the cold nights, the warm days and the cold nights, and it just keeps seesawing, it's like this mother nature's fight, right? Where at night, the areas that were uh, previously just watery and just a soupy mess, now freeze up tight again. And all that freeze thaw activity works things loose from the shoreline, number one. So anything along the edges, you're starting to introduce all kinds of just fishy material, organics, uh, knocking loose certain invertebrates, and you're creating a little bit of current and flow in different situations there. You also introduce more oxygen into the water, and so you've got fish that are, they're feeling, they're feeling a little bit spunkier, right? And you've got more feed and more bait in the system, and this is where some of the classic inside weed line or mid lake flats, like even 10 foot of water, you can find crappies riding like literally right below the ice because they're looking up. All that stuff that's melting out and coming out uh, is stuff that they're looking to eat. So that's when you get, uh, you know, the real tiny sight, sight rod and you're just kind of peeking and you're looking for fish kind of cruising just below. Some of the biggest crappies of the year are caught that way, especially on like good coontail flats and, and good cabbage flats. Uh, some of my best bluegill fishing occurs then, and it can be really shallow. Like when I say inside weed line, I mean, yeah, like five feet of water. And it sounds crazy, but you know, guys down in the Mississippi River, the backwaters areas where I fish a lot, like that's no big deal, two, three feet of water. I mean, it, uh, that's where those fish start to work their way under. So it, it's different in every system, but at the end of the day, late ice, there's a lot of magic happening. And all of it's related to these natural conditions. And a good late ice period means that, like I might, I might need to swim out to the ice sheet, right? I might, I might need to find ways to get like a picnic cable or planks or something out there just to get out onto the ice sheet that's still really thick. And man, the, the longer that that late ice kind of fights back and forth, the better bite I tend to have year over year. Now Joel is gonna share a few key baits that he likes to use when he's fishing in shallow water. So when I'm fishing these shallow weed beds, uh, it's really not rocket science when it comes down to bait selection. For me, there is a little bit of method of madness, not so much with color selection, but definitely with bait styles. Um, I think just like I did or during early ice, there's active fish in the system. I'm trying to target those active fish. And so I'm fishing loud and proud. I'm fishing quickly. I'm fishing a lot of spoons. And for the most part, I'm, I'm fishing spoons that don't rattle. Now there can be exceptions to that, but I prefer spoons without a rattle because again, like I've been talking, predators are in this area and too much commotion, especially audible commotion, tends to bring in those predator fish. But a lot of times visual is what it's all about for the crappies. Um, and so especially on, on big crappies, I, I'm, I'm using some pretty big, some pretty fast baits and I challenge these fish. And if they tend not to eat it or they don't want it, well then obviously I'll let that help decide what I'm gonna tie on next. But the forage minnow spoon, the glow shot fire belly, 
the bro bug spoon all these little spoons uh, they really do make a difference like i look at this bro bug and it's a very uh it's a very buggy system here with the eyeballs it fishes quick it's kind of long and needle-like so it tends to dart fast this one this fire belly is great it's just it's so visually appealing with that uh, that glow shot center to it and then uh, this forage minnow spoon i fish um, in several sizes so i fish it in this size uh, which is the 16th ounce size and i also fish it in the 32nd ounce size on the 32nd ounce size I use it to challenge bluegills with all the time. And I, again, my, my whole strategy when it comes to fishing these spoons is to fish quickly, find aggressive fish, and make it happen. Now, that doesn't always work, right? Sometimes fish will snub you and things uh, aren't always as they uh, would or should seem when you first head out onto the ice. So that's where kind of the one-two punch of those spoons with uh, both the tungsten gill getter, as you can see right here, flat sided really really uh, really nice being able to see this on sonar this one shows up really good on a flasher and then uh, the tungsten mud bug jig which has kind of a little more of a circular element to it its eyes uh, protrude just a little bit kind of has that 45 degree down angle this one's great with live bait I prefer uh, the tungsten gill getter with plastics I try to use plastics especially for bluegills during late ice if I can get away with it. If they are finicky for whatever reason, I don't have any ego when it comes to needing to catch them on plastics. I can go to live bait, that doesn't bother me. But again, I start fast. I expect to catch fish fast. I expect to use spoons. I expect to use the forge minnow, the, the glow shot fire belly, you know, and the bro bug spoon. But you know, if that doesn't work, I tend to seal the deal with some smaller tungsten. But you know, this is typically only on cold front days. Uh, days when things just aren't all working out maybe fish are a little bit more neutral so at the end of the day get at them get after them fast stay shallow spend some time observing with underwater cameras and uh, really put it to them it's a great way to catch fish and it's become one of my favorite ways throughout the entire winter especially late ice well, that's about all we got for you in this video. Special thanks to Joel for sharing some really good info. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you have a lot of success fishing in shallow water this season. If you enjoyed this video and you learned something, make sure to hit that little red subscribe button down below because we have a lot more awesome content coming in the future. And until then, we will see you in the next one.